Give the Lord some praise. All right. Let's get to know each other for just a second. The Bible says, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This word clap is the Hebrew word talkala, and it means to drive a nail through. Which means every time you clap your hands, you got to know what you're doing. You're driving a plan. You're driving a nail through the plans of the enemy that he has set up over your life, over your children's life, over your family. So why don't you clap your hands and drive a nail through the plans of the enemy? Come on, clap your hands and give God some praise in here. listen he goes on to say he said clap your hands all you people shout unto God with the voice of triumph ruah in the Hebrew it means to have a trumpet down in your throat now every 50 years they would blow the trumpet in Zion which symbolized the year of release also known as the year of Jubilee which means every time they blew this trumpet all of the debt you had incurred had to be forgiven. Every student loan, every house note, every car note, every debt had to be forgiven. All of your children that were bound had to be set free. Somebody's children's gonna get saved in here tonight. All you gotta do is clap your hands, open up your mouth and shout hallelujah. Come on, shout hallelujah. Now listen, while you're standing, I want you to do me a quick favor. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I see you in the future. And you look better than you do right now. Tell him, I'm about to give God a praise for what he's about to do in your life. Come on, give God a praise for your neighbor. Breakthrough is coming. Healing is coming. Change is coming. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout. Now do me a favor, while you're standing, let's celebrate the greatest pastor and pastors that you know. Your pastor, your leader, Pastor Marco and his wife, Pastor Lisa. Let's give God praise for them. You may have your seats. Listen, I want to say this. I, uh, I am so grateful to be here tonight. I uh, lived in California for quite some time. In fact, I know the organ player, so I know he's got my back tonight. He's a Kojic guy, so. But, <laughs> but, um, but I'm grateful to be here tonight, and I want to say this. I have studied this ministry, and I've studied what you guys are doing, and I am blown away by what God is doing in this church. Somebody ought to say amen. I mean, you ought to be able to celebrate your own church. Somebody say amen. And I just thank God for the realness of your pastor, and I thank God for his spirit. I had a chance to spend some time with him in the back, and I just love being around genuine people. How many of you are tired of dealing with fake folks? You know how to recognize, I'm going to preach in just a minute, but you want me to tell you how to recognize a fake person? They're always changing friends. Yeah, because once I find out you're not who you say you are, then you got to get somebody else to be your friend long enough for them to figure you out. But I'm tired of figuring people out. How about y'all? And I'm thankful that I can meet some genuine people in this world, and I have done that in meeting your pastor. Can we give God another praise for them now? Amen. Thank y'all for having me tonight. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy. This, this is going to be a dangerous message. It's going to be. 
it's going to be dangerous. I told the Lord, I said, I don't want to preach to impress anymore. I want to preach to impart. So he gave me a dangerous message. If you will, turn with me to 2 Timothy or go on your phone or your tablet. 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 7. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. It says, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And one version it says, a sound mind. I want to leave the thought with you tonight. If you're not scared, you're not doing it right. I told you it was a little dangerous. I said, if you're not scared, you're not doing it right. Now, I know this is a little counterintuitive to our verse, but I want you to ride with me for just a little bit, and we'll get to that. But I want you to know that things are not always as they seem. Have you ever met people that just look like spiritual giants? It looked like they could just do anything by faith, and it seems like that these people are immune to fear. It seems like they are fearless in their endeavors. In fact, I used to think I was that kind of person. But how many you know life has a way of hitting you so hard that it'll snap you back into reality? <laughs> has everybody, anybody ever been hit so hard that it knocked a dream out of you? Well, we're going to get it back tonight. It may seem that they're immune to fear, as I've said before, and I've learned over my time on this planet The fear isn't going anywhere. In fact, one of my favorite theologians, Paul Tillich, said something very powerful. He said doubt, which is just another form of fear, doubt is not the opposite of faith, but it is a part of faith. What does this mean? This seems so strange because I've been taught my entire life that faith and fear cannot cohabitate. But Paul Tillich is telling me that doubt is a part of the faith process. Why? Because when you have a dream big enough, you will always doubt your ability to make it happen. Which will cause you to completely and totally have to lean on God and say, God, if you don't do this, it can't be done. God, if you don't break this addiction, it can't be broken. God, if you don't turn this situation around, it can't be turned. Hey, listen, I've done everything I can do, God, on my end. Have you ever done everything you can do? Well, that's when God has to step in and take care of the rest. And I want to let you know tonight that God is getting ready to cause your doubt to work in your favor. And let me tell you something. you got to get a dream so big that it scares you. I ain't got no dreamers in here tonight. I need a few dreamers in here. How many ready to get a dream so big that it scares you? A God kind of dream will stretch you beyond your abilities. A God kind of dream will put you in a position where your money doesn't matter anymore. A God kind of dream will put you in a place that if he don't bring it to pass, it's not going to happen. And I don't know about y'all, but in 2022, I'm ready to step out on faith like never before. I'm ready to go for it like I've never gone for it in my life. I'm ready to shake off the dust. I don't know about y'all, but I'm getting fired up again. I'm ready for God to do something tremendous in my life. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. Let me work with this just a little bit. So I want to show you tonight that fear is a part of it. If you're doing it right, but you don't have to succumb to your fears. The first point I want to leave with you tonight comes from the first part of this verse. This is why I remind you. Paul says, I'm reminding you. So there's a a process, I believe, in forgetting and remembering. So what I want to share with you first tonight is that you need to forget what you've been through and remember who you are. Now watch this. It's easy to tell people, forget what you've been through. I don't know if you ever forget what you've been through in totality. What I'm saying is you remove the power of your past. See, 
I remember everything I've been through. In fact, have you ever gone through something in your life and while you were going through it, you couldn't figure out why in the world you were going through what you were going through? You know, when I first came into the, uh, I was a Baptist guy. When I first came into the Pentecostal church, everybody was preaching this message, I'm coming out. No, no, I'm sorry. They were preaching this message, I'm going through. So everybody was going through something. And every message was about going through. I said, you know what, I'm going to let them go through. I'm going to go around. (laughs) But I learned something about pain. I learned something about life. I learned something about real life. And that is you can't go around the pain. It's too wide. You can't go under the problem because its roots are too deep. You can't go over it because it's too high. And the truth is they had it right. You got to walk right through it. You may have to walk through it with tears running down your face and your hands trembling, but you got to keep on walking. And I learned something, y'all. When I come through the backside of what I've been through, I always look back and say, God, I thank you for what you brought me through because it made me who I am. Have I got some champions in here tonight that know that everything you've been through made you who you are? Let me share this with you. Every person in here was a champion before you were ever born. At the moment of conception, 500 million potential people are released. I said that in a real church way, didn't I? 500 million sperm are released is what I'm trying to say. Out of those 500 million potential people trying to make it into the earth realm, you fought against all 500 million of them and made it here. Now I had a set of twins, so two of mine got in, but what can I say? I'm a champion. But the point is, you had to fight to get here. Ask somebody beside you, what's wrong with you now? Come on, don't stop fighting now. You're still a champion. Tell somebody, I was born a champion. And I'm going to keep on winning, because all I do is win, 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 no matter what. Y'all ain't ready for me tonight. Can y'all look at somebody and tell them, say, all I do is win. All right, watch this now. So I don't forget it, but I forget the effects of it. Are y'all with me? Now, Paul said in Philippians, the 13th chapter, forgetting those things which are behind me. So Paul, in one sense, is telling us to forget. But then in this verse, he's telling us to remember. A little confusing. But if you read Philippians, you'll find out that that third chapter is all about Paul's past works. It's all about what he did in the past. He didn't forget it, but he said, I count it all as done. In other words, it didn't matter to him. In other words, he was Janet Jackson on him. What have you done for me lately? Come on, she's got a documentary coming out. I thought I was being relevant. Oh, I guess not. But what have you done? What are you doing with your life at this point? It's not what you've done in the past. We have so many people that are caught up in what they did. Nobody cares what you did. What are you doing now? In fact, We always want God to do stuff now, but we don't want to do anything. Oh, I'm sorry. I I told y'all I'm not preaching for popularity tonight. Let me say it like this. Faith requires your action. So if you're going to deal with the fear factor, because remember, you got to have a dream so big it scares you. You got to understand that faith doesn't work alone. There has to be action. There has to be something that you do. Tony Robbins once said, never leave the scene of a decision without taking immediate action. You got to do something when you activate your faith. Albert Einstein said, nothing happens until something moves. James put it like this. He said, faith without works is dead. 
That's what I'm talking about. Talk to me, man. Say it again. Let's go. That's my kind of guy right there. If I had my briefcase, I'd give him $20. I'll pay for these amens tonight. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Look at somebody say, let's go. So it takes action. But in order for us to take action, we got to let go of the past. So I'm forgetting not necessarily what I've been through, but all the pain that's associated with it. All of the struggle. In other words, I'm using it in my future. Romans 8 and 28 said, and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, that are called according to his purpose. Now, I got a problem with this verse. Paul says, and we know. My question is, who is he talking about? Can I work with that for a second? Then I'll get back to the text. Who is he talking about? Who is the and we know? At first I thought, well, maybe Paul is talking about church people. That when I'm going through a difficult situation, my church people will help me out. And certainly that's the case, but there are some church people and people in general that instead of helping you out, will dig your grave, <laughs> kick you in it, throw the dirt on top of you and praise dance on your grave. The problem is, they didn't recognize the worst thing you can do to a seed is put it in the ground. Thank you for burying me, I appreciate it. Thank you for counting me out, I appreciate it. Thank you for telling me I would never make it, I appreciate it. Tell, thank you for telling me I was gonna turn out like everybody else. I appreciate it, because when you buried me, I grew up from the dirt and became more than I could have ever been if you never put me in the ground. Somebody shout hallelujah in here. Let's go a little further. You gotta let go of the past. I'm trying to move on from that, but God has me just sitting there. Watch this. I love physics, but I'm terrible at math, so I can never be a physicist. But I'm fascinated by the theories and by the laws, and, and I'm just fascinated by it. Every object in motion will remain in motion at constant velocity until acted on by an outside force. I, I love it. But there's a, a certain law called the law of the pendulum or the swing, and it works kind of like this. If we were to take a rope and somehow tie it to the middle or the ceiling, and put a ball on the end of it, the theory is that you can hold that ball against your face, release it, and that it won't come back and hit you. So I tried this with one of my daughters. <laughs> put the theory to the test. I put her on a swing. I pulled her back as far as I could. I stood in place, and I released her. When she came back, she stopped about a half inch from my face. And the Lord spoke to me distinctly and clearly. He said, I only give you enough momentum to launch out into your dream. I never give you enough to go back. There's nothing for you in the past. In fact, what happens is, once God expands your horizons, you no longer fit in the past. Have you ever tried to hang out with people you used to hang out with, and then you realize how dumb they are? Sorry, I didn't mean it like that. That was kind of... Like, why in the world and who in the world was I hanging out with? But you got to forget your past. And remember who you are. Who am I? I'm a child of God. God has filled me with his spirit. I'm an heir with God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I am somebody. And I believe that because God has called me to be his ambassador, because he has called me to be a man or woman of God, whatever he's called you to do in your life, God wants you to remember who you are. 
When the devil tries to hit you with sickness, remember Isaiah 53 and 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we're already healed. You got to let the devil know that I am a child of God and I know who I am. Poverty has no place in my life. Sickness has no place in my life. Whatever the devil tries to bring my way, I know who I am. And when you know who you are, you become dangerous. I don't know if I should say this or not. All right, I was hoping y'all would say that. When you know who you are, when you are confident, you become attractive. Watch this. I'm going to say it. This may be the last time I get to preach here. <laughs> but generally, once a month, a woman secretes what's called a pheromone. A hormone released into the atmosphere. This pheromone is designed to put an air of attraction in the atmosphere. And the reason why I know this, because I read this medical periodical once, and the title of the periodical was, When the Ugly Woman Looks Good. I said, man, I got to read this. And it said that there's a pheromone that's released that can literally because we all have what we like, right? And it's all different. But you can literally like something that you normally don't like. Something that you don't find attractive can be attractive when this pheromone is released. Now that's an amazing concept. Now I thought about it from a spiritual perspective. The Bible says that God inhabits our praise. And so, when I give God the praise, what I'm actually doing is when I, look, look, when I'm in an ugly situation, when my situation is ugly, somebody say ugly, but I praise God anyway, I send up a spiritual pheromone in the atmosphere. The Bible says that we are a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God. I send up a pheromone into the atmosphere that attracts God to my ugly situation. In other words, if you want God to turn something ugly into something beautiful, you got to learn how to give God a praise in your ugliest situation. Look at somebody and tell them, say, if you ain't scared, you ain't doing it right. Can I just flow? I'm going to get off these notes. Can I just flow a little bit? Yeah. All right, watch this. Leah, Rachel was beautiful. She was the pinnacle of physical poker, too. That's what you say to your wife, fellas. You're the pinnacle of physical poker, too. Try it. But you got to be cool with it. You got to kind of drop your voice down. You, know, you are the pinnacle physical poker too. But, but she was beautiful. Now this is not my take on it. This is the Bible's take on it. Leah, her sister, was ugly. Take it up with the Bible. It's not me. Rachel was beautiful. But she couldn't produce. She couldn't have any children. Leah was ugly. But the Bible says, oh, y'all don't believe me? Leah in the Hebrew, Leah in the Hebrew means long-legged gazelle or wild cow. <laughs> Which means when she was born, her father looked at her and said, mm, wild cow. Now, you know you're ugly when you're on daddy. But watch this. 
But the Bible says that when God saw that she was hated, he opened up her womb. In other words, the beautiful thing couldn't produce, but the ugly thing did. And I want to let you know tonight that this is the year that the ugliest situation in your life is about to produce the greatest blessing. I'm glad y'all got that. Think about the ugliest thing you're going through right now, and you just ought to speak to it and shout, you will produce. The worst situation in my life, I'm going to mess around and write a book about it and become a millionaire. God's about to turn some things around in my life. God's about to shift some situations. God's about to move in my favor. And I know it may be a little scary through here right now, but I'm going to keep on believing God because God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, can I deal with Leah, and then I'll get back to the text. Leah had four children in rapid succession. The first son she had, she called his name Reuben. In the Hebrew, it's C, comma, a son, exclamation point. She said, now that I've given birth to a boy, my husband will love me. It didn't work. Next son she had, she called his name Simon. Some say Simeon. She said, the Lord hath heard. That's what that name means in the Hebrew. The Lord hath heard that I was hated. Now will my husband love me. Didn't work. Third son that she had, she called him by the name Levi, which means to be joined. Now will my husband be joined unto me. But somewhere along the line, her attitude changed. And the last son she had, she called his name Judah. Judah means praise. She said, I have done everything I can to get this man to want me. But with this last son I'm having, I'm going to get my hair done for myself. I'm going to get my nails done for myself. I'm going to go buy myself some new clothes. I'm getting ready to have a party. And I'm going to name this boy Judah because I'm getting ready to give God a praise for myself. Look at your neighbor and say, that last praise was for you. Tell them, that last praise was for you. I'm getting ready to give God a praise for myself. I'm getting ready to praise him for my breakthrough. I'm getting ready to praise him because this is my year. I'm getting ready to praise him because God is about to turn. All right, let me close. And I didn't cover all this, but let me close. He said, fan the flame. I'm almost done. Fan the flame of your gift. Stir it up, is what the King James Version says. Fan the flame to the gift. First of all, I want to let you know you're too gifted not to make it. Every person in here is gifted in some area. You're too gifted not to make it. But watch this. you got to get fired up about your gift again. That's my second point. I guess we're at the second point. Get fired up. Thank you for five people that got my back on that one. I appreciate that. What happened to the vivaciousness? What happened to the joy? What ha happened to the power? What happened to that compelling force? The spirit of the living God that sets you on fire. Jeremiah put it like this. He said, I wanted to quit, but it was like fire shut up in my bones. And I thought about this today. I, I was thinking to myself, I've, I've heard a lot of people say, I never quit at anything. I've heard a lot of people say that. They say, I never quit. Well, I have quit at some things in my life. Hello, how you doing? I have quit at some things in my life. But one thing about God is he'll never let you get too far. He'll never let you stray out too far away from him before he pulls you back in. And I feel like God is calling us to a deeper level of commitment this year. I feel like God is calling us to a deeper level of holiness this year. I believe that God is calling us to a deeper, a deeper level of service this year. Let me say this to you. Your dream can be burst right where you are. 
I told him in the car on the way over here on that seven hour drive from Los Angeles <laughs> and all that traffic. Atlanta's bad too, believe me. Atlanta, Atlanta, we need prayer, y'all, for traffic. But I was telling him on the way over here, I said, you know, submission always puts you in position. I know it's hard to clap on that one, I know. But let me tell you, everything that ever transpired in my life, according to my dream, came through the ministry that I was serving. Everything, every person that I met, every hookup I ever got, everything that ever happened, it came because I was serving. And when you can get a servant's heart, and I want to drive that home tonight, I believe that God is calling some people that have a heart to serve. Can I talk to y'all in here? I'm going to get back to dreams and vision and all that stuff, but before your dream can come to pass, you got to learn how to get connected. Look at somebody and tell them, say, I'm connected. All right, let me close this. you got to get fired up. So many of us, because of the multitude of things that we've had to deal with, it's caused us to lose that gift, that excitement. And if we're going to do this thing right, we're going to have to exercise our faith for the dream that God has given us. And we have to do as Paul says, we got to fan the flame of our gift. I'm almost done. Watch this. If you blow a candle, the air blows the candle out. But if you blow a flame, the flame increases. So it's all about size. So small dream, easy to blow it out. Big dream, you can blow on it all you want. Please, all my haters, please blow on it. All of them. Because when you blow on it, all you do is blow it up. All you do is increase the flame and the fire. You got to take everything you've been through over the course of your life and say it's all fuel to the fire. I wish I had some fired up people in here. Come on, look at somebody and tell them, say, I've been through some hell. But it's all fire to my future. I'm all fired up and I'm getting ready to go for what God has for me. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. The last thing I want to say, and I already said this, is you're too gifted to give up. Stir up the gift. Now let me get off of that. He says stir up the gift. Then he says in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Well, let me preach it in reverse order real quick because it's anticlimactic if you end with self-discipline. Because that's what he starts with, or that's what he ends with, a sound mind, which simply means self-discipline. If you're going to accomplish anything in this world, you have to discipline yourself. Discipline is a part of the process. Now, I had seven things that you need to do to discipline, but I've been preaching too long, so I'm not going to give you the seven things. Y'all want it? Okay. Well, let me put my glasses on. All right, so in order to to have self-discipline, you must first expose your mind to positive messages. So the first thing you got to do is be careful what you let in. Because what you let in is what's going to come out. I slipped up and cussed. Well, cussing was in you. I'm just saying. Ain't no slip up. It was in there. (laughs) And whatever's in you has got to come out. So expose your mind to positive messages. Hang out with positive people. Listen, I'm not hanging out with people always complaining. Let me tell you the kind of people I like to hang out with. I called a friend of mine. This has been years ago before I was ever on TBN, and I had a dream of being on TBN. This has been many, many years ago. And he called me on the phone. He said, what's your dream for whatever year it was? I said, this year I'm going to be on TBN. He hung the phone up on me. (laughs) I called him back. I said, man, why why did you hang the phone up on me? He said, man, everybody knows you're going to be on TBN. Call me back when you get a real dream. (laughs) That's the kind of people you got to surround yourself with. 
the kind of people that will push you into purpose. I don't need somebody telling me all the reasons why I can't do it. I'm looking for some people that are ready to do it. We can do I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. All right, number three, and I'm going to move quickly. I don't like to waste people's time. Number three, determine how bad you want your desired goal. If your why is strong enough, you will have the strength to follow through on your what? You need to do to create your desired goal. In other words, determine how badly you want your desire. Psalms 37 and 4 said, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. Now, I want to suggest to you, and maybe I don't have enough time, but I want to suggest to you that most of us are in trouble because we got what we wanted. Lord, give me this man. Okay. God gave him to you. Six months later, you say, Lord, please take this man. No, you got exactly what you wanted. Because the truth is, our desires are dangerous. Most of the time, what we want is because somebody else wants it. But I believe that God has custom-made blessings. That's why I can celebrate you when you get blessed. Because I know God has a custom-made blessing for me. But desires get you in trouble. The original Hebrew says, Psalms 37 and 4, delight thyself also, Lord. He will give to you what he intended for you before the foundation of the world. In other words, God has what he wants to do for you before you were ever born. And it seems like what you want is better, but it's not. And I know it's not because it left you wounded. It left you broken. It left you destitute and despondent. It left you unsatisfied. When God blesses you, it will... <laughs> I'm trying to be good. I don't know y'all like that yet. All right, my family, you're right. So back to my regular, if God give you a man, he'll make your toes curl. But anyway, I'm trying not to say this stuff. All right, let's go a little further. Number four, visualize yourself as already in possession of what you have. This is probably the greatest key to manifestation you can ever hear in your life. You have to believe that it's already done. Understand something about God. God operates in the realm of faith, which means in his mind it's done, and it's done right now. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to manifest immediately, but in my spirit, I already got it. In my mind, I already got it, and I believe I got it right now. I may be sick, but in my spirit, I'm healed. The devil said that. God said I'm healed. I may be struggling financially, but the Lord said I'm blessed, so I got to come out of this. And guess what? I'm out of it right now. Hebrews 11 and 1 said, now faith is. Somebody shout now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Psalms 118 and 17 says, or Psalms 118 and 25 says, Save now, O Lord, I beseech thee. I beseech thee, O Lord, send now prosperity. Somebody shout, Lord, send it now, send it now. Yeah. Ephesians 3 and 20 said, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think, according to the power that works in you. Somebody shout, God is doing it right now. I believe that it's already done right now. I'm getting ready to dance like I got it. I'm getting ready to shout like I got it. I'm getting ready to holler like I got it. Touch three people and tell them, say, neighbor, in the name of Jesus, it's already done. Oh, y'all going to make me preach a little bit. Lean on somebody and tell them, say, neighbor, it's already done. Done. 
Uh, I'm about to close. I got a couple more here, right? Which one was that, number four? Number five, set small achievable goals. Look, dream big, but have some goals to support your dreams. I, I teach vision. I have a, wrote a book called In Vision. I teach about vision. And the concept of vision, not only do you have to believe that it's already done, not only do you have to surround yourself with the right people, but you got to do what number five says, and you got to set some achievable goals. Dream big, but get some marks along the way that keep you motivated to your dream. You may not lose 60 pounds in the next month, but you can lose five pounds. I can talk about it because I lost a lot of weight, so I can talk about it. My point is small, achievable goals. All right, watch this sixth one, and I got, I got to finish. Become accountable to somebody. You need an accountability partner. You need somebody that's going to keep you on course. Look, it's easy to set a goal and go hide in secret. It's another thing when you say it in front of your friends. Jesus spoke what he had to speak in front of the disciples. Watch this. Jesus cursed a fig tree in front of his disciples and nothing happened. Nothing. They came back the next day and it, the tree was withered up from the roots. But how confident in faith do you have to be to speak to something dead in front of your boys and you're supposed to be the son of God and nothing happens? God, I wish I could touch that. Most theologians believe, and I'm finishing, I promise. Most theologians believe that when Jesus cursed the tree, it immediately dried up. But what they believe is that it was late in the day and the disciples didn't recognize that the tree was already withered. And a lot of times we don't recognize that God has already done it. We're just catching up to what he's already done. Oh, I wish I could talk. Ephesians 3 and 20, I quoted, it says, Now unto him that is able. Able is a Greek word. One translation means power in action, which means God has already released the power to do it. All we have to do is link up with what's already done. All right, let me close. Did I give you number seven? Get to work, take action. We already talked about that. Action. You have to take action. All right, he says, now I'm closing. 2 Timothy 1 and 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Let's deal with this. This word fear is not the normal Greek word for phobia. It's a word that means cowardice. In other words, what Paul was saying is, it's not that fear won't show up. It's that you have the power to stand up to it when it does. Look at somebody and tell them, say, neighbor. Y'all don't mind talking to your neighbor, do you? Look at your neighbor and tell them, say, neighbor. You may have to do it scared, but do it anyway. Come on, you may have to do it with a little bit of fear, but it lets me know that I'm doing it right. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm doing it right because I got a little bit of fear. But the fear lets me know that I don't have to do it under my own power. But when I let God have his way in my life, his power is released. And when his power is released, nothing is impossible to him that believes. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm getting ready. Can I preach like that in here? I don't know. I'm getting ready to go to the next level in God. I don't know about y'all, but I'm tired of being down. I don't know about y'all, but I'm tired of being in a position where I'm trying to figure out how in the world I'm going to come out of what I'm in. The truth is, I'm already out. And like I said before, it's already done. Which means I can face every fear because I know I already got it. Now I wish I had some praisers in here that would take the next five seconds 
clap your hands, open up your mouth, and give God some praise. Why am I praising him? Why am I praising him? I'm praising him because he's bringing me out. I'm praising him because he's getting ready to turn some things around. I'm praising him because my change is on the way. I got a praise down on the inside that says I'm coming out of everything. 2000 and 2020, 2022, this is my season. This is my year. If you believe it, shiny air, yeah. shiny air, yeah. shiny air. Yeah. Lift your hands all over the building. You may be scared, but it's a sign that you're on the right track. And you don't have to cower down to fear. I love this church because I can feel the faith that's alive in the building. You don't have to succumb to fear. It's going to come but you can stand up to it. Don't be the coward that lays down just because it got a little tough. Let me tell you something. I don't care what anybody says. Life is hard. But with God on your side, there's nothing you can't overcome. How many of you know you're more than a conqueror? Somebody shout, I'm more than a conqueror. I want to pray for your dream to come alive tonight. I want to pray for some dreamers. Pastor, if it's all right, do you mind if they come to the altar for prayer? I want you to, if you're dreaming, this is only for my dreamers now. If you're in this building tonight and you're ready for your dream to come alive, I want to impart something in this house. That's it. They're coming. I want to pray for you. Change is about to take place. Spiritual healing, mental healing, physical healing. Change is about to take place in this house. If you're ready for your dream to come alive, let me say it like this. There comes a point where your side hustle becomes your primary. And that's what I want to speak over you tonight. What you've been doing on the side that you really love, God wants to release that into your life. God wants to impart the vision and the dream into your life. I want you to come and lift your hands on this altar all over this building. As they come to the altar and all over this building, I want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person on this altar tonight. I pray, God, that the vision would come alive. I pray that the dream would come alive. We've been through so many trials, so many struggles. Life has tried to knock the dream out of us. But fire us up again, Lord. Empower us again, Lord. Let us do your will on a whole nother level this year, God. God, where we've become weak, strengthen us. Where we've come to a place of wanting to give up, God, empower us in the name of Jesus. You know every need, Lord. You know every struggle. You know what we're dealing with right now. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I impart fresh vision. I speak to every dead place. I speak life to it now. In the name of Jesus. God, I pray that healing would take place on this altar. Somebody came to this altar. They said, yes, Lord, I want my vision to come alive. I want my dream to come alive. But God, I'm hurting tonight. And I need you to touch me. God, touch that family. Touch those children. God, touch that marriage. Touch that job situation. Whatever we're dealing with, Father, touch it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, put your hands together right where you are. 
and just shout, it's already done, it's already done, it's already done. Hallelujah. Come on. High five your neighbor and tell them, say, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. I'm blessed, I'm blessed. As you go back to your seat, find somebody and tell them, say, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed.